Net Tonight, a special report into the billions of pounds of taxpayers' money wasted on government computer projects. How interactive TV is hitting the screens in Hamburg. Plus, our games review with jewels, virtual classrooms in the highlands and islands of Scotland, and sailing the seven seas with the software pirates. on the counter will be able to summon at the touch of a button all the details about the person's benefits stay. That was the brave new world promised in 1989 by Eric Keynes, then head of the Department of Social Security's £2 billion project to computerise Britain's benefit offices. It's the largest of a multitude of government computer projects that have failed to live up to their promises. Many of them have been criticised in official parliamentary reports. We've decided to take a taxpayer's tourist trip around London to see just how much money has been spent and more importantly, how well it's been spent on your behalf. First stop, the local benefit office. So what happens when you want to go into an office and make a claim? Is it all one touch of a button? No, no, very, very far from one touch. You, ha you have to go to different offices and fill in different uh, forms. And there's very little interrelationship between the different claimant systems, benefit systems. Uh, this, this has been a, a fairly typical failure of gr a grand project conceived from the top and implemented with very little uh, control from the people who are going to use it. Customs and Excise began work in 1988 on replacing an ageing system for clearing freight. Latest estimates put the cost of the project at £85 million, but freight companies, who are the end users of the system, are far from confident that the money's been well spent. From what I can see of the project, it's really replacing something that worked perfectly well with something new that doesn't appear at this particular time to work as well as the old system did. So how does the taxpayer gain from this £85 million? Oh, I've absolutely no idea. There's no perceivable benefit that, uh, that I've come across. But Customs and Excise say the new system has already saved them £40 million by bringing in additional taxes and duties. They maintain that the old system led down a technological cul-de-sac. Lords tried to bring itself bang up to date by computerising reports of its proceedings, but it ended up suing the supplier after a system that was supposed to cost £200,000, in fact cost £1.4 and even then the Lords did not deem it to be of acceptable quality. <laughs> Ministry of Defence computer projects are characterised by disaster. Witness the £950 million wasted on a computerised radar system for the Nimrod aircraft. Apparently, the computers were too heavy for the plane. One official report points to eight out of nine critical information technology projects going seriously awry. One of those projects, to computerise Ministry of Defence offices, has led to a doubling of the pilot project costs. The finished project is now expected to cost a total of £400 million. We've uncovered a number of other money-wasting projects, including police and ambulance systems, systems run by the Department of Health, the Department of Employment, the Department of Trade and Industry and the Foreign Office. Taxpayers' money has even been wasted by the Inland Revenue. So why have all these projects gone so disastrously wrong? 
Uh, I think there's certainly a degree of naivety involved. And there is the assumption that because the government has got certain standards in terms of developing systems, it has its own particular uh, mandated and standard methodology, that automatically the thing will be correct when it's delivered. Uh, and, and that really is grossly naive, and that does give rise to a lot of the problems. Here at the Bank of England, a £25 million system called Crest is currently under development. Now, Crest is designed to better automate the process of buying and selling shares. But already, it's the second system of its kind. The first, called Taurus, crashed at a cost of £150 million. That project was privately funded. So will Crest, which is funded from the public purse, fare any better? Crest itself is, a, is not, I, I believe, a particularly high-risk project for the Bank of England. Didn't and they that say it, that about Taurus, though? I don't believe that's terribly relevant. The point I would like to make is that the Bank of England has built three systems of this broad type before. So is there a risk as far as the taxpayer is concerned of, of losing millions of pounds? I do not believe there is. Even Her Majesty the Queen has had her royal computer problems. A £300,000 system was installed in 1991 to keep track of more than half a million paintings and other treasures in the royal collection. But paintings have gone missing, and their disappearance has only been detected when police have discovered that paintings have been sold illegally. We've identified another 23 money-wasting projects. Together with the £2 billion from the DSS and other projects we've just seen, that comes to a grand total of nearly £5,000 million. That's the equivalent of giving a free PC to every school child in the country. Undoubtedly, there have been some benefits from a few of these systems, but those benefits certainly don't amount to value for the enormous amount of taxpayers' money that's been spent on them. This is a ruby special. They're all marquee cut rubies. You're going to love it. Take a look at this ruby. Cascade ring. For today's media executives, interactive television means video on demand and home shopping. But for a group of artists in Germany, interactive TV has a far greater potential. Known as Ponton, the group is responsible for a range of experimental interactive TV programs. Their production, Piazza Virtuale, ran for 100 days on German satellite TV and anyone with a telephone and a television could take part. The result was a freewheeling and truly interactive experience which so impressed the broadcasting world that Ponton have been commissioned by the Atlanta Olympics to produce a global version in 1996. Ponton is a research laboratory from artists, technicians, um, artists of the different disciplines from literature to painting to uh, programming art and uh, we are based here since 1986. The basic idea of Piazza Virtual is very simple. We just uh, turn the broadcast from one to many uh, into a two-way communication system from uh, many to many. And what we use is we use the television, the normal television broadcast as a kind of uh, feed to the uh, population that we want to reach and provide um, access for everybody with different means, uh, with a telephone, with a touchtone telephone, video telephone, slow scan, uh, video transmission, um, text, modem, fax, um, all sorts of communication. Piazza Virtuale is the transformation of the, the public places in the cities and where people meet, uh, talk, chat and uh, be together to the electronic media of television. The idea is not to make people watch something, but uh, get people into uh, getting together. In a 
ponton event like Piazza Virtuale, the viewers become the broadcasters. At any one time, a handful of the audience can contribute to and control the multi-layered media mix. No rest for TV, no rest for TV, ma, ma, ma. So what I have here is a normal telephone, which everybody has at home. It can be anywhere in the world. With this telephone, you can control the robot camera at Ponton. So if you were on the other side, and you can control the camera with your telephone, you can speak to me and see me on the TV, and the camera will be controlled by your telephone at home. So this is phone base or interactive um, music recording studio where you can um, use your telephone at home to play um, music, make recordings, make multi-track recordings and have a lot of fun. Phonebase is a system where you can uh, communicate with uh, some people while making music. A lot of people can call at the same time and uh, playing instruments, uh, even if they don't have a um, um, recording studio like a sampler or so. Mr. I'm not an anarchist, right? I'm an artist, right? One of the access media was, we call that uh, public entry points, is a sort of a box containing a monitor, a camera and a microphone, and people can uh, see the program, uh, look into the camera, and uh, interact directly with the program by pushing a button on these uh, black boxes and they were standing uh, in public places wherever people meet. What we do is basically we provide uh, means for the audience to step through the screen into television and use this medium actively. Well, Evelyn, uh, what do you think about the future? The future in Italy? The future in Germany? Generally, in the world. In the world, hmm. Now, I think we the future are looks like people on Earth. It's looked quite bad now, but it, I hope it's getting better. Personally, I'm very excited about this new uh, network uh, interactive culture because I think that uh, it brings television to a more um, human speed, actually. I don't think that interactive television can, uh, as in comparison to television, uh, uh, can um, cut. Next in our weekly games review, Jules gets in the pink with Pinky for the Amiga. And still to come in the net, networking the far-flung classrooms of Scotland, plus the plundered booty of the software pirates. This is my fast food franchise outlet. And I see from the menu that I do actually have some cows at last. Can I have a cow, please? Sorry, love, cows are off today. Excuse me. What? Uh, my dog's camera shy. I was wondering if you could be a stunt double. Will I be on the telly? What? Be quiet. We're meant to be doing a game review. This is my castle. And as usual, I'm meant to be doing a game review. I'm going to tell you about Pinky on the Amiga. What? What? It's a skittle game. You know, the type where you jump around and collect things and kill things. In this game, you play a little character called Pinky. I think he's called that because he's pink. Anyway, his world is all very nice and cute, and nothing naughty happens like in all those other games. It's a quick and simple story. These dinosaur eggs are near extinction, and wouldn't it be nice if we went and saved them? Ah! Oh. Like I said before, he's very pink, cute, 40 zargles old, whatever that means, and he's happy. And, um, that's it. Oh yes, and I mustn't forget to tell you about the fully recyclable and pollution-free vehicle pod thing that he drives. And, um, that he likes plants. Actually, I haven't been able to think of a score for Pinky, 
I do know it's somewhere between 0 and 10. Distance can be a problem in the highlands and islands of Scotland, where even the daily journey to school can take a long time. Lochaba High School houses around 1,250 pupils aged from 12 to 17. They travel across one of the largest catchment areas for any secondary school in Britain, many using the ferry as a shortcut every morning and evening. Others from the most outlying areas have to sleep over at school during weekdays. Scotland's unique set of educational needs have spawned some innovative and forward-looking solutions involving computer networks that link pupils across the highlands and islands. I live 13 miles out of this Fort William where the school is, so it takes a 26 mile journey a day to get to school and back. Um, the school's just behind me, you can probably see it, but uh, you can't really go forward with education much further in Fort William and the nearest college is in Inverness which is 60 miles away. The nearest university really are in Glasgow, that's over 120 miles. Claire Mackenzie, she's a sixth year pupil at the high, well, Hubbard High School. She completed higher computing studies last year and this year she's studying for her certificate of sixth year studies which involves as an option communication systems and networks. Now she's a, got in a class, a virtual class of 30 pupils. The only difference is instead of them all being the one building, they're a distributed over Highland region, which I think is geographically the biggest region in the whole of the United Kingdom. A certificate of six year studies is a one year course. I started it at the start of June last year and so did six other people in Highland Region. I'm the only person in this school to be doing it, although there are, the six others are in places like Tain, Aberdeen, Inverness, up to 100, 150 miles away, so I have to keep in touch by electronic mail. What we're trying to do really is teach computer education, educate pupils about computers, as opposed to train them in their use of one specific package. The time these pupils leave school, whatever is state of the art today, will be certainly obsolescent if not obsolete by th in three years' time. David Leckie's influence has spread outside his computer science department into other disciplines. The history department has recently started producing their own learning resources using the school's computers. What we're doing is we've got 20 computers in this room, so the pupils will be looking at them in twos. They've got the images they're wanting on a disc, and we'll be drawing the programme across the network. This allows them to decide by themselves what they want to look at and to take their own time to make their own way through the material at their own speed. We've been studying the Vikings, so what we're going to be looking at today is images of a Viking sword which were found in the area. This particular sword was found on the island of Egg, which is part of the Lochaber district. Like all the other historical objects, it's been taken away. <laughs> It is in Edinburgh, but other stuff is in Inverness. It's far too far for us to go and see them, but the ISDN and the museum's um, project allows us to bring these images back into the school and then to tailor them in such a way that we can present them in an interesting way to the pupils. ISDN, or Integrated Systems Digital Network, is a fast way to send large and complicated data files over long distances. The curators and collections of the National Museums of Scotland are largely based in Edinburgh and we've been working over the last few years to build a new museum in Edinburgh, the Museum of Scotland. With the Museum of Scotland project, we're taking the opportunity to build multimedia packages which will allow the whole community of Scotland to gain access from a remote location to good quality images and content of information relating to those objects across the country. By giving teachers uh, such as Ian Rose in Loch Arbor High School access to these images which they can rework, then we get to uh, a position where pupils in remote areas of Scotland are being taught directly from material relevant to them, from a local base teaching national and international information. Well, we've still to become aware of the opportunities that the 
computer networking can bring to small communities, if they can bring the education into them, then that means that we get rid of the problem of children having to leave home at the age of 12. So that keeps the school going and keeps a younger community able to survive in the, these rural areas. Once you get onto the job market, then we're still to appreciate the effect of networking and just to what extent it will allow people to work from home rather than to concentrate in busy offices in big cities. So the whole idea that wealth and earning wealth had to be concentrated in big cities, in industrial offices and so on, has broken down and people can go back into the smaller communities and enjoy quality of life quite different there. Well, I enjoy living here. It's, there's, pl there's plenty outdoor things to do. I think I'm going to have to live somewhere else if I'm going to work with computers eventually. Although it would be easier to perhaps work remotely using a, data, using a modem at some point. Um, I like living here, but cities tend to be more useful for computers and technological things. Software piracy is different from other forms of intellectual property theft. If you photocopy a book, it's expensive, it takes a lot of time, and you end up with an awkward pile of paper. If you tape a CD for a friend, the reproduction is never perfect, and the tape gets chewed up. But computer software can be copied in a fraction of a second, and every copy is perfect. This simple fact cost the software industry $13 billion last year. I think the fact that software can seem to be intangible, sometimes it even seems to be invisible, unfortunately encourages people to think that they don't need to take software piracy seriously. They see a plastic diskette, they know that software is on it, they copy it onto a machine, but it's not like driving an automobile out of a garage. You don't recognize that you've just stolen something when you've done it. The piracy rate across Europe, on average, is 61%. That means six out of every ten copies of software in use were illegally copied rather than purchased from the software publishers. That, those kind of losses add up to $4.9 billion across Europe in 1993 alone. There are some countries around the world that we in the industry refer to as one-disc countries. You ship in your first disc and you know you really don't have to ship in anymore because the rest will be copied illegally. I think one of the main reasons for the success of the IBM PC clone and putting a computer which runs identical software on 60 million desks worldwide has been the free movement of software. And a lot of that free movement is what the Business Software Alliance might describe as theft. In the end, it's the ability to try out software, to get a wide range of software, and to play with it. Many of those packages you're not going to make serious use of, but it's that openness which makes it attractive. So I think you can turn it around. I think without software theft, there wouldn't be a big PC industry, and none of these people would be making so much money. Microsoft and most other software companies have at one time or another given some thought to technical protection. There are a variety of forms. One form is uh, code that goes in the program that allows it to be reproduced or installed on a computer only once. Uh, another form is a hardware dongle, which is simply a small mechanical device that plugs into the back of the computer and allows a program to be used only as long as the dongle is attached. But the best efforts of the software houses come to nothing when confronted by a dedicated pirate on the high seas of the internet. At a cracking party, you'll have groups of uh, programmers who have got hold of a bit of software which is copy protected, and they will reverse engineer the software and take out the copy protected mechanism. Why do they do it? The challenge, when a software manufacturer protects his software, 
um, so that no one can copy it. It's like a red rag to a ball, as far as these crackers are concerned. And they see how easy it is for them to crack it. And obviously, uh, once they've done that, they put in their own titles, basically to boast about the fact that they've cracked this software. How hard is it to catch them? Impossible. The problem with the internet is that someone might have put up an illegal copy of a piece of software on one machine. They may not put it there directly. They may have hopped through a few other machines in the process. So if you're then trying to track down who on earth actually did this in the first place, you might have hopped through several machines through several countries, and eventually the perpetrator might be in a foreign country you can't even prosecute. The last time the FBI tried to do this, they went through a period of months tracking someone down, and in the end they couldn't prosecute him because he was in a foreign country. So it's very difficult to actually find who's done it and then actually prosecute them for doing it. We are stepping up the number of actions we bring against this form of piracy because we think it is becoming more serious. We think we can raise the stakes and therefore raise the deterrent level of our actions and get people to think twice about running the very serious risk of jail time that's involved in operating these bulletin boards. Uh, has anybody been put in jail for a long time because of it? You know the answer to that one? According to the BSA's own figures, only one person has ever been sent to jail for software piracy. But if the widespread piracy of software is inevitable, what future is there for commercial software? Some believe that software companies should stop fighting and face these realities by looking for other related ways to get revenue, such as software support and customization. We see quite a lot of ways to make money other than by the original sale of software. Um, anyone who buys and uses software needs support. Many times there are people out there who want specific developments made and if you don't use up all their money in paying for the software then they may have got some money to put into further development. Piracy is a colourful word nearly always employed by people who think that they stand to make a great deal of money by stamping it out. Pirates roam the high seas killing people. Uh, they didn't just copy floppy disks and give them to their friends. Coming up after the credits, Netcetera. Start your video now. Or for a printed Netcetera and details of the BBC Networking Club and other network services, send a stamped address envelope to this address. The Net, Programme 6, BSS, PO Box 7, London, W3 6XJ. Next week, instead of the net, the Chelsea Flower Show. But we'll be back in two weeks' time with the lowdown on viruses, the village in rural Herefordshire that's becoming a role model for the wired community of the future, and an exclusive interview with interactive artist Geoffrey Shaw. And finally, from the net... People always ask why I gave away my book, Hacker Crackdown, on the internet for no fee. I don't need a lot of money right now. What I need is for people to understand what I'm talking about. And uh, making the book available for nothing and just distributing it on internet helps, and I think it does, because I get a lot of electronic fan mail about it, then all the better. I'm not out saying that every author ought to give away his book on the internet for nothing, but I would not be surprised if in 20 years they in fact did.